pembersihan hutan. I think we are live on YouTube, but I'll just check if sure. people could see us. Yeah, I think they can see us now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Karwan. After a long, long, long break, we are back with our sessions. And uh, uh, we did our last session two months back, which was, uh, I think, Patrick Oliver's uh, conversation on Dharma. And now we are back with another interesting session and quite a unique session in many ways because I often say that I don't like historical fiction, but I keep getting them in the mail by various publishers. But there was one book that uh, interested me quite a lot when it came last year uh, in my mail, which was called Lahore, part one of the Partition Trilogy by Manreet Sodi Someshwar, who is our guest today on Caravan. So welcome, Manreet. Thank you so much for joining in. I won't waste time in a formal introduction. She is the best-selling author of Lahore and Hyderabad, along with many other fictional books that you should read. But I'll show you two of her wonderful books that uh, that inter that that maybe reignited my interest in or ignite my interest in historical fiction after a very long time. Uh, and I read Hyderabad when I got a uncorrected copy. I couldn't read the corrected copy, the final version, but uh, I read Lahore when it came out. And we also had an Instagram session last year. So we thought we'll do a combined session here on YouTube so that you all could get to know about both the books as part of a narrative which starts from Lahore, then Hyderabad, and finally to Kashmir, which might come out next year. And we might not talk about that book in this conversation because it's not out yet, but we'll do another session hopefully next year again around the same time to talk about all the three books again. But thank you so much, Manreet, for accepting the invitation. Always a delight to speak to you. Thank you, Ishan. It's lovely being, uh, you know, with uh, you and with Karma, which, as you know, I have shared before, is doing an excellent job. Uh, and it's a student-led initiative, which I think makes it uh, so even more wonderful. So more power to you and your team. So uh, why don't we start with the introduction of Hyderabad? Would you like to just introduce the book to the readers before we start the conversation? Sure. Uh, so let me just, you know, sort of put things in perspective. Um, uh, Lahore, as you mentioned, is sort of book one of the Partition Trilogy. Uh, Hyderabad is uh, book two. And then we have Kashmir. There's a little uh, cover that you can see on the back, which is book three of the Partition Trilogy. Now, um, Lahore is set in the months leading up to the independence and partition of India. So really the timeline starts from when Dickie Mountbatten, who was the last viceroy, arrives in India, which is uh, late February uh, of 1947. And the uh, timeline is till September of 1947. So a month after independence and partition have happened. And really in Lahore, what I'm interested in seeing is what were the discussions happening in Delhi uh, amongst the political leaders and what were the consequences of those discussions, those decisions that are being taken upon uh, the Aam Admi and Aurat in Lahore? And um, uh, so the, 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 the three books have the same dual narrative. There are two narratives. One is Delhi-based. And in this, it, I have protagonists uh, Joharlal, uh, Vallabhai, and Dicky, who's Dicky Mountbatten. And since they are my protagonists, the narrative is in their voice. So it is Jawahar speaking, it is Vallabh speaking, it's Dicky speaking. And uh, in Delhi is the common people, in uh, Lahore is the common people. And similarly, after uh, you know, we have independence and partition, uh, I wanted to write about two other stories, which I think are either not known about or are misunderstood. So book two is Hyderabad. And uh, I've had people tell me like, Hyderabad ka kya kahani hai? What is the story there? 
And, uh, you know, the uh, common assumption that we have in India today is that the map of India that we see is the map that the British left to us. And we could not be more uh, deceived because the British for one had no interest in the territorial integrity of India. You know, they had been here for close to 350 years in some form or the other. And when they decided to leave, they were, we are out of here. We just want to make sure that every white man, woman and child is safe and can be, uh, you know, sort of plucked out of the country right away. So as a result, what happened is that uh, India at that time under the rule of British was broadly two kinds of Indias existed. One was under the British directly. Uh, and then there was the India, which was with the princely states, they were called, which was under the jurisdiction, the rule of Nizams and Maharajas, uh, who had a British resident with them. So they kind of reported into the British, but they were mostly allowed to do their calling. And when the British were leaving, uh, we all know that they created Pakistan. But what we forget is that there were 565 princely states in India. So just we should pause, it's a huge number, 565. And the British said that uh, by the laws of partition, each state has the option, they can choose to go with India, they can go with Pakistan, or they can choose to remain independent. Now just imagine you have these states, they're kind of scattered all over India. And to give our audience a sense, almost 40% of the current Indian landmass that we see was with these princely states. And the other complications, 300 of them were in the area which is broadly uh, Gujarat now. So um, if we could allow them to say, okay, I'll go to Pakistan, you could have a princely state <clears throat> in the middle of Madhya Pradesh, which is a part of Pakistan. Uh, you, you could have a, the 200 princely states in uh, Gujarat out of the roughly 300, which were independent, which means that if you're driving down from Bombay to Ahmedabad, you probably have to stop at 10 checkpoints of these independent princely states and say, Hanji, I'm, you know, I'm going forward. So this is just to give an idea. And the British had no interest. So there was this huge sort of mammoth undertaking by uh, Vallabhai Patel, who was the uh, sort of minister of home and became the uh, you know, deputy prime minister, who along with VP Menon, uh, basically got down to the task of saying, how do we get these 565 princely states to accede to India? Because barring three states, all of them were Hindu majority, but in many cases, they were not necessarily ruled by a Maharaja. They could have a Muslim Nawab or a Nizam at the helm. And they were very actively assisted in this by uh, Dickie Mountbatten, who was the Viceroy, who was interested also in not leaving India in a complete mess. You know, people have, uh, they're very conflicting assumptions and opinions about Dickie Mountbatten. And my trilogy is based off 20 years of research. And I have tried to portray these men, uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, Vallabhai Patel, Vaisrai Mountbatten, as accurately as I can from the material which is available to us in public records. So um, what happens to cut a long story short, so when 15th August arrives, uh, Vallabhai Patel and Menon have done a fantastic job because there are only three, uh, Vallabhai used to call them apples on a tree which have to be plucked and put in this basket of India. There were three which were still outstanding. That was Junagar, Hyderabad and Kashmir. Now Junagar is a, uh, you know, people who know their map of India or who are watching and can quickly look it up. Junagar is, uh, has a seaboard, you know, it has access to the sea, to the Arabian Sea. Uh, Junagar was Hindu majority, but it was ruled by a uh, Muslim uh, Nawab. And Junagar actually acceded to Pakistan. So, you know, which for many reasons made a lot of strategic sense for Jinnah because uh, Verawal was the big port in Junagar. So Karachi to Verawal. Uh, and Jinnah, as Vallabhai Patel says, Jinnah can literally have his Pakistan Navy standing in India's waters. And from there, connecting, getting into Hyderabad was a short flight away. And the reason I bring in Hyderabad now, which is, so Junagar gets resolved quickly enough. I mean, one could do a, a story around it, but it doesn't have that much meat because Vallabhai basically, and you will learn in the book Hyderabad, I have that story, how quickly it gets resolved. 
But Hyderabad was a, um, a fascinating place because it was the largest uh, princely state of India, the wealthiest. The Nizam, who was uh, uh, Mir Usman Ali Khan, the seventh of his dynasty, was the wealthiest man in the world. He featured on you know, the cover of Time magazine in all his splendor. And then Hyderabad was a Hindu majority, uh, 85% but was ruled by, as I said, the Nizam and his family had ruled for over 200 years. And adding to all the complexity, Hyderabad was locked in the belly of India. And I just want to tell our readers that Hyderabad princely state is not Telangana and Andhra Pradesh as you know today, because the princely state had parts of what is Karnataka and Maharashtra uh, today, as part of the princely state. So it was a very large state. And the Nizam uh, had always been regarded by the British uh, as a very faithful ally. In fact, he was considered numero uno. He was you know, sort of the, the first amongst all the princes. And that is because he had helped them with you know, his, his enormous wealth. So, uh, you know, come uh, 15th August, uh, the Nizam says, I'm going to stay independent. I'm not going to align with India. I, I may, in fact, choose to go to Pakistan if I so wish, because the rules of partition allow me to do it. And that is like a literally a body blow to both uh, Vallabhai Patel and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, because the entire idea of the Indian Union, which is what the term that was used at the time, was that uh, we want to get the citizens of these states into the modern program of nationhood and nation building, which means you want to bring access to education, you want to alleviate poverty, you know, all the programs that are undertaken uh, in a new nation. And also in terms of defense, if uh, Hyderabad decides to go to Pakistan, what, what do you do, you know? And so this was a huge concern, obviously, in Delhi. And the Nizam was, as I mentioned, uh, he's a hugely, uh, uh, he's a Lear-like character. You know, if people who have read King Lear, uh, Shakespeare's sort of play, and also based off uh, an actual character, the Nizam was a person full of contradictions. In fact, I feel people should write uh, an entire novel on him because he was a he was a poet. He was well versed in Persian, in Urdu, Dakhni, of course, uh, you know, and and English. He published his poetry. Um, as I said, he had fabulous wealth. He used to keep these trucks, which were laden with jewels in the basement of his palace. Um, he uh, did a lot for the advancement of education in the, in the princely state of Hyderabad, opening Osmania University. Uh, Hyderabad apparently had fabulous infrastructure, the roads, uh, you know, the British residents and the British who came to visit, they, they thought that Hyderabad was not in India. It was so wonderfully well-maintained. But at the same time, uh, Hyderabad, uh, you know, if you moved away from the city uh, of Hyderabad and Sikandrabad to an extent, the poverty was excruciating. The huge levels of income inequality. And at the time of our story, which starts in July of 1947 and goes to September of 1948, uh, which is when Hyderabad was forcefully annexed by India, um, there was a, a peasant rebellion happening in the countryside. So again, this is something that most people are unaware of, but there was a huge communist-led uh, peasant rebellion. So the peasants, common people, men and women, and women were equal participants, were rising up against the landlords um, and, and protesting and forming uh, units you know, to revolt uh, against the repression. And China had an interest in, in, in that red uh, uh, sort of uprising which is happening uh, in Hyderabad, which again was a reason for Vallabhai and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru to be concerned, because India, remember, is a very new nation. And in fact, most uh, historians and social theorists had said that this is not a nation that is going to survive. So, you know, there was a huge task in terms of just keeping this entity together. So that's the you know, story of Hyderabad. We begin with uh, the Nizam saying no, and then Nizam has a very smart uh, British lawyer uh, who's uh, giving him advice. Uh, he's uh, Walter Monkton. And Walter Monkton's claim to fame uh, you know, was that he actually was the man who got uh, 
you know, the, the king uh, before Elizabeth's father was, was the one who abdicated his throne, right? And Walter Monckton was the one who got that abdication done, make sure the king had his, you know, whatever uh, wealth that he would get from giving up his throne. But he was a very astute lawyer and he was a constitutional lawyer. And the Nizam had him and he, there were ongoing negotiations between Dickie Mountbatten, VP Menon, and, you know, sort of the legal team sitting in Delhi. And the Nizam's team was entirely led by Walter Monckton, who was, as I said, exceedingly sharp, knew what he wanted, uh, you know, uh, to get out of India. Now, the problem is, uh, while all this is happening in the background in Hyderabad, there are two things happening. There is what the term we use nowadays called competitive communalism. So there is this uh, Razakars who are sort of this volunteer army, very militant, and they were led by a man called, uh, 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 my name is going out. And he, uh, it'll come to me, but he, he is, he is fomenting trouble in the countryside. So he is getting the police involved. He's trying to terrorize people because they're again working on the same assumptions that if we get enough Hindus to move out of uh, the countryside, out of the princely state, we can maybe disturb the ratio uh, a bit. And remember all this is happening in the face of this huge refugee problem. You know, uh, there are people who have migrated in and out of Punjab, Eastern and Western, uh, which is what Lahore covers. And Delhi, which is the capital city of India, is literally teeming with these refugees, right? And the Razakars are watching it. So they know there is a way to actually drive people whom we don't want, who won't fall, fall in line with, with us, out of um, you know, the princely state of Hyderabad. So they are the Razakars. But at the same time, there is the Hindu Mahasabha and the Arya Samaj who are leading the, the, the sort of the, the Hindu faction of volunteers, organizing camps, you know, getting people engaged and energized. So we have uh, the communist rebellion, we have the Razakars, we have, uh, sorry, Qasim Razvi. Yeah, Qasim Razvi is the guy who's leading the Razakars, and then we have the Mahasabha and the Aris Samaj. And the midst of it all is the Nizam, a hugely eccentric character who can't seem to make up his mind. And then we have, you know, sort of the, the Delhi thread. And as always in the Hyderabad thread, I have the common people. So I have Uzma, who's a maid who works in the palace. There is Jabli, who is a, um, uh, uh, you know, works with the, what is a peasant, is a young peasant woman who works with the uh, communists. And, is, you know, they are trying to forge their way and figure out what will happen. And the story is just like a, thriller because time was a thriller you know at that time it, 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 things were happening before people could get a handle on them and I'm trying to capture that sense of frenzy that sense of uh, we don't know what the next day is going to bring escalating violence uh, from all sides and uh, that is the attempt in Hyderabad to tell the story of this absolutely wonderful culturally rich uh, uh, state culturally rich province, area, which we seem to have forgotten. Uh, you know, so that's what I'm trying to do with it. No, that's very true. We, uh, unfortunately, the, the focus of the partition studies or the books on partition has always been Punjab and Lahore, which was your first book, but we have forgotten about the Deccan and the, and the Bengal. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, a lot of things. And you said the time was a uh, thriller at that time. So much was happening and people were either unaware or confused of what was going around them. And not just the common people, but even the Nizam uh, or uh, other bureaucrats and uh, politicians who were playing the, the game of chess at that time. Um, they were also confused about the next move. So it was a, it was a great time in some senses and it was a pretty bad time. But I would like to ask you, uh, how did you get in get interested in this thing? Because you were writing the Taj Conspiracy, which is one of your best-selling books, which is which has nothing to do with the modern kind of <laughs> world. But how did you uh, write about the partition? How because I know all South Asians, uh, South Asians, in fact, the Indian subcontinent people, partition is something very connected to us, regardless of whether our family faced migration or not, but it is part of our collective 
memories right, right. that come to you yeah um, that, that's a great question ishan and actually partition is as you say it is uh, whether we acknowledge it or not it is part of our heritage and actually it runs in our blood uh, you know it is it is considered the largest migration uh, in modern human history you know roughly the estimates vary but 12 to 15 million people and literally with a span of 3 to 4 months trudging across the border um 1 to 3 million some claim even 5 million uh, dead and um, for me particularly partition holds great poignance because i come from a uh, small border town in punjab called firozpur it is uh, smack on the border between india and pakistan uh, the satluj river is really the boundary line um and to add to the complexity uh, of the situation uh, firozpur was a muslim majority town at the time of india's partition but um, there is a lot of speculation and i won't go into it but some of it uh, the factually what i could is there in hyderabad because i take a chapter to talk about that um when sir radcliffe created the boundary line he does a squiggle around firozpur and firozpur stays within uh, eastern punjab which is part of indian punjab so now imagine a situation where uh, this muslim majority was i think 60 65% muslim majority town suddenly is placed in an indian punjab which will be non muslim uh, obviously riots happened overnight uh, my my father's family uh, is from an uh, agricultural land own, owning family and my father's father my grandfather uh, when he was very young you know he would talk about he tell stories of how they had to quickly assemble the 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 farm hands you know most of the time the the situation was the landlords would be non muslims and the farm hand the people who actually worked on the farms were muslim and suddenly it became their responsibility to ensure that these people you know stayed safe but how do you do that when the entire sort of community is baying for their blood and remember this is a time when rumors news are just flying thick the trains which are pouring in you know with with wounded bloody passengers and people have reached this sort of conclusion that they will not let a single one of their non a community member survive <clears throat> so you know the stories of uh, my grandfather and some people putting these men assembling trucks putting them in trucks under the cover of darkness getting some of the army soldiers to go with them and literally sort of just transporting them across the boundary line um <clears throat> so i grew up in a town where every household had not just a story to tell but stories to tell um you know uh, our, our favorite mithai shop was called kasuri on the hatti it's only after Uh, late adolescence i figured oh kasuri on the hatti is because these guys came from kasur which is across the border which if you start sort of walking from firozpur to lahore you we will pass kasur kasur is the birthplace of baba bulle shah who is considered sort of the greatest uh, you know sort of of sufi poets and bards of punjab uh, you know the thing is when you're growing up in a place which is suffused with all this it is a part of your background part of your furniture you don't pay attention but for me i started paying attention because um, i was in my teens when what is called the punjab problems began you know the the militancy era in punjab it is called the lost decade of the 80s but it actually lasted close to 15 years and my father was a criminal lawyer so uh, you know i we got used to uh, our doorbell ringing late in the night my father would get up and go out and there was these tall strapping sardars who would come and say that the police came and plucked my son uh, from the house and uh, at that time we had something called tada which was a terrorist uh, and disruption activities act so basically it allowed the police to take people and put them in jail and basically there was no bail available and unless you reached within 24 hours uh, with a particular uh, writ called habeas corpus which literally is latin to show me the body you would not know where your son was and and these were boys who were being taken and there were uh, many of these boys were then taken to the border uh, our border is called the husaini wala border it is sort of the less glamorous cousin of the vaga <laughs> but 
Firozpur was called the red hot terrorist hotbed at that time. So the, the boys were told to run in the direction of Pakistan, shot in the back, and the police would say, okay, terrorist encounter, we've notched up another, you know. So we saw it happening. Uh, and my father was very closely involved because he was one of the fewer lawyers who were actually trying to take up the cases of these boys because that was a time where if you're not with the police, you are a terrorist yourself, you know. And I saw all of that very closely because my father's one mantra when he was raising us was that you can ask me anything and I will never lie to you. I will tell you, you know, what. So of my siblings, I was the one who would wait for my father to show up. At times he would take two days because you, you, know, you would have to go, uh, you know, thani, thani jake, you talk to the right people, you try and get information. Many times the boys would come back so badly uh, mutilated. A lot of them would not be able to walk ever again. But the reason I bring it up is at that time, uh, the narrative in our town was it is 47 all over again. In 47, it was Muslims versus non-Muslims. In 84, you know, which led to 84, 84, Chaurasi is sort of, you know, like you have Santali, you have Chaurasi. In Punjab, these are not just numbers. They have huge significance. The weight which we attach to these numbers, it, it's a shorthand, right? When, uh, like the Holocaust was shorthand for the Jews. Right, uh, so Ch Santali, Chorasi, these are this is a shorthand for an entire encyclopedia of things for us. So, uh, you know, I grew up with all these stories, listening to all these narratives again, but you know, I was uh, a high school student, I had physics and chemistry and math to think about. And so I did not sort of pay attention because, you know, you, you had to just, it was a day of curfews. Uh, one day school is open, the other day it is closed. A lot of uncertainty. Uh, we lived through it. I went to engineering, uh, uh, like any other uh, sort of good Indian academic household. Uh, I went to business school. I am Calcutta. I went to Bombay to work. And it's only after like almost a, a decade of my corporate life, uh, we moved to Singapore on my husband's job. And I thought I'll take a break, you know, uh, because I had worked with uh, Unilever and Booz Allen which is a consulting firm. I had traveled a lot and I just wanted a break. And it was at that time that uh, my father had passed away and you know, maybe I was still mourning in some ways. I just felt this desire to write, you know, sort of to just, just write, to grab a notepad and a pencil and just write. And I remember I, all the writing I had done was you know, sort of PowerPoint presentations in, in my corporate career. I had, never, I had always been a student who was very interested in English literature. But, you know, I had never sort of pursued it. But I wrote a short story uh, and I realized that I was not happy. I, I wrote a short story based around the militancy period. And I realized I didn't know, I didn't understand. So, you know, it sort of started my journeys to the Singapore National Library, which is again a fabulous uh, library network. And I just started reading up everything. And whatever I was reading would take me, keep taking me back to 47, take me back to pre-partition India. And then I realized that there was this huge narrative arc. I mean, 84 just didn't happen. It was situated within a particular narrative arc. And unless I understood the whole thing, I would not be able to write that short story. So again, I started that mission in 2001 and the short story became longer. It finally came, became a novel called The Long Walk Home. Um, which came out with Harper Collins, and uh, I'm very happy to say that it was sent to Guzar Saab, who actually dedicated one of his shares for it. He liked it so much. So my engagement, in a sense, with partition began in 2001. That's why I say this trilogy is born out of 20 years of research. I have uh, returned to partition over and over. Uh, the Radiance of a Thousand Suns, which came out in 2019, again with Harper Collins is my attempt to link 47 and 84, and in fact, sort of bring in the Mahabharata as well, you know, sort of how the template gets, uh, we're still working on the same template. Uh, but my focus has always been in, when I tell these stories to bring the women into the narrative, because I feel, uh, you know, history, especially the way we tell it is really his story, uh, and women who were equal participants, if not more, because a lot of men do the violence, but it's women's bodies that become the battlefield. So the women's stories are never told. And, you know, the reasons in our society, women are told to just 
shut up, seal your lips, because hey, you know, family ka is the honor, all of that. And so my focus has always been to get women's stories in, uh, leave that. And I think um, for the longest time, I was not sure I could begin writing the trilogy because it has, as I told you, uh, Vallabhai Patel and Jawaharlal Nehru, you know, these sort of towering figures. But if I have to write them as by characters, I need to know them intimately. I need to know what does Jawaharlal Nehru eat for breakfast? What does Jawaharlal Nehru tell his daughter Indu? What are his grandsons doing in his home? Vallabhai Patel, what is money been feeding him? Why does he have a colon issue? You know, what is the special meals she prepares? When Vallabhai gets angry, because remember, he was called a frozen volcano. How does he deal? You know, so I have to know them very intimately. And unfortunately, our, uh, in India, our record keeping, the historical, uh, you know, data available has always been, Achale. it's limited and also it's scattered. So yeah. this journey has been with me for, as I said, almost two decades to the point that my daughter used to say when she was younger, my mother has a lot of old dead men as her best friends <laughs> because I have these notebooks on Jawaharlal, on Vallabhai, where basically, have, you know, the clothes they wore, you know, their relationship with each other, the relationship with the women in their lives, everything, wherever I could, I have just written it down. So then at, when, the, when I had finished Radiance, I was... I have to do it now or it'll never get done. And that's when I you know, sort of took the plunge and committed myself to writing the trilogy. So that's yeah, my long answer. answer. No, it, an interesting part of your narrative, as you said, is the presence of women and the centrality of your women characters. And also at a time when, you know, the surroundings is in a despair, uh, it's not a good time, but there's, these women are sort of the point of hope in some senses, because, uh, you know, there are love stories in this, in these volumes and they center around the women. And in Hyderabad, it's more complex because the woman has to choose. Yes. Uh, so that option that you have given to the character, it's, it has given it a lot of layers, more layers than uh, they could in real life have maybe. Mm. Uh, I, I'm very sure that there must be some women like your character, um, the, the, the communist uh, uh, rebellion in, in that time. So how, uh, so how do you develop your character? You said those old dead men are also your characters, <laughs> but those were yeah. real people where you could get, uh, where you could get all the material available, uh, what they ate, what they dressed, how they dressed like, what they spoke. But about these subaltern kind of people that you wrote about, the commoners, mm. how did you research for it? How did you de develop those characters? Yeah, excellent question again, Aishan. So uh, as I said, so my, my fealty, my loyalty in, in the trilogy is to both the Delhi thread and the Aam Aadmi in our thread. So which means that, as you said, while, you know, that intense research which goes in, you know, uh, if, if Jawaharlal Nehru doesn't drink wine, I can't show him drinking wine, right? I mean, it's as simple as that. He did smoke cigarettes. He smoked a certain brand of cigarettes. I need to know that. I need to know, for instance, did that brand of cigarettes come in a tin or did it come in a paper packet? So, you know, that is the kind of research I do because my hope is that when anybody picks it up, they should, they should come back out of it better informed. They should know, okay, so this happened. And then they make up their mind. They all hopefully they look at that and then they go do more reading on their own to figure out what was happening at that time. So similarly, the, you know, whether it is in Lahore, where I have Kishan Singh, I have Mehmood, Bailey Ram, Tara, Pami, uh, and in Hyderabad, where it's Uzma or Jabli or Daniel, these are actually composites of real people who existed at the time. And let me explain how I get to them. So one is uh, sort of the oral tradition, you know, because I, as I said, I grew up in Firozpur and I've been working on this for 20 years. As far as Lahore was concerned, there were a lot of, for researching the long walk home, the radius of the thousands, I spoke to a lot of people. A lot of people who obviously are, when I was talking to them, were elderly. Some of them have obviously passed away. Um, and there was pushback. These are memories you have buried. It's a time of intense trauma. Nobody wants to go back. 
Um, I took a course uh, in New York City where I live at City College uh, with an excellent professor on trauma studies. You know, how do you understand trauma? How do you uh, begin to comprehend it? What are the tools you use? How do you then start representing it uh, you know, in literature or in film? You know. So for Lahore, I had a lot of people to go back to. I also accessed whatever material you know, there is available. And there is very little in terms of sort of published material. Um, with, with, but that was sufficient because as I said, it was just a, a lot of it is just accumulation, just getting it all. You know, which is why I could not have this written this book within two years of researching it. I could not have done it. I didn't have the material. I don't think I even had the emotional uh, maturity or the understanding. Uh, you know, and there were things people told me, uh, uh, like the, an elderly Sikh gentleman, you know, once when I was talking to them in the household, he said something. He said, Kise de hat saaf nahi. you know, Kise ke hat saaf nahi. And nobody's hands are clean. And this is something I, I want to bring to the fore because a lot of time when we talk about partition uh, and the narratives are about us and them, India and Pakistan. But I can certainly say for Punjab, you know, because it was such a syncretic culture, but the violence happened on both sides. And a lot of times why we do not speak about that is because men in our own households were party to that violence. After that, you know, we told the women not to speak, the men never spoke. But when you read the narratives, you will come across men who shot, gathered the women of the household, brought the gun out and told them, I'm going to shoot each one of you because the family honor is at stake. And it happened. Now that person is not going to talk about, you know, partition, not going to talk about violence and going to look forward. So these are very complex, very strained, very painful, uh, memories but you know you have to find a way to sift through them to look for the truth to find the characters who begin to speak to you and as i said they're composite characters because you know as the idea of narrative is also to dramatize the conflict so that when i am reading it i have those 300 pages with me i can develop the empathy and get to it but it's not that these are not true that may have not happened to what tara goes through may have happened to two women but i have given both of them to her you know and I also think that you cannot write about war and violence without writing about love. Because everything, you look at any memory, you talk to read up Holocaust, uh, at the heart of it is love, whether it is love of a man for a woman, a parent for a child, a child for the pet. You know, we saw in the Ukraine current Ukraine war when it happened. There were children who, you know, and grown-ups who did not want to leave their pets behind. Who said, we will not go unless my dog, I can bring them along. You know, love is at the crux of it all. And I think that is a redeeming feature because it allows us to tell these narratives without everything just being so dismal. And in the case of Hyderabad, actually, there is, there is some published material on the peasant uprising. Wonderful, wonderful women characters. I didn't even have to create a composite here because the woman who's, the, the peasant struggle started with a woman, a poor peasant woman called Chityala Ailama, who said, I will not pay the rent, you know, the landlord, uh, the excessive rent. She started the movement. And the because it was, you know, the communist, uh, the communist manifesto said men and women are equal. It, it sort of started off from that narrative. So a lot of women who joined these camps were told you're equal. Right? In, in reality, things were a little different, but women came with that courage with that confidence. And a lot of women were, you know, my character Jabali is a courier. A lot of women did very dangerous things. They carried out very dangerous operations because again, you know, the male mind, they don't look at a woman and assume, oh, she's a spy or she's doing something. So yes, I mean, uh, you know, I, the, what I have done with both the books is that there is a bibliography, which is of course an incomplete bibliography because I've spent, as I said, so much time reading this, but those, List of books is there for people to, as I said, if you're interested, you pick up a book, find it in the library and read, and that will give you, get you even closer to my source material. But I just want to reiterate that the Delhi thread and the common people thread is as real as it can be. These are all characters who lived. Uh, it's just that I made them my characters. I gave them certain things that, you know, maybe they did not have at that time. Um, in the hope that, the, you know, we read these stories and we, both acknowledge what, what a 
fabulous, intricate, complex past we've had, and we appreciate where we are because of that. Uh, so in your writing style, uh, as, as I could gather, the superstructure remains historical, completely based on facts and your research. But within that, you insert a few uh, characters who are also in some senses real, could be real, uh, but you create a small storyline within a historical framework, which I think is rather rare in historical writing because what people do is people keep the characters as historical, but they change the surrounding and environment to completely something uh, not historical or ahistorical, so which I think is very uh, interesting. And that's why I think this book got my attention. Uh, as I said, I'm not into a historical fiction <laughs> reading, but this was a completely different kind of a historical fiction. And you mentioned in the beginning about Mountbatten's character, how he was, and now, you know, when you, saw, you see uh, the crown, uh, you have another picture of Mountbatten, again, <laughs> uh, different from your book, different from history books. Yeah. But an interesting point that you mentioned in this answer is the emotional uh, maturity. When somebody is writing about trauma, Archer's recent book in the in the language of remembering talks about the lack of vocabulary to support uh, a tragic event as partition that was life changing for the entire subcontinent. Yeah. So when you were writing, when you were creating a story, how did you face that emotional uh, wave or or whatever you want to call it, the flood of emotions that you must have faced because you said you were from a city which had so many partition refugees, survivors, migrants, or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Um, you know, I tell people when they ask me uh, about writing, about particular kinds of writing. And <laughs> in fact, I quote a writer, I forget the writer's name, but he said that if you feel the urge to write, he advises them to take two aspirins and go lie down in a dark room. And if the urge still persists, then you might as well get up and, you know, get to the business of writing. And while it's very uh, sort of humorous, I think it, uh, it does point to a fundamental facet of, of a writerly life. You know, a writer's life is very solitary because you have to be able to enjoy your own company. Um, you know, you, you spend so many hours uh, at your desk with these make-believe characters uh, and especially if you do the kind of historical fiction I, that I do, you spend a lot of time in the libraries, in the archives with librarians. And added to that, if the layer is that you're dealing with a subject which is as uh, traumatic as partition, then you know there is a lot of memories, a lot of stories which are very painful that you have to process. And I, I would say that I do it again, uh, you know, uh, because. I am a writer who does a very deep dive. I spend, I write every day, except for weekends. I write five, six, seven hours at a time at my desk. And I think what I do is I have trained myself uh, because my life as a writer and my life as a mother has sort of run in parallel, um, you know? And uh, as I said, so my daughter would believe that my best friends are these dead men. <laughs> so I, what I do is that I, once I've finished my writing for the day, I, to decompress, I, my way of decompressing is spending time with my family. And I talk about my writing with both my husband and my daughter. They, they know my character so well. So even Merunissa from the Taj Conspiracy, my daughter was eight at the time and she would say, I hate Merunissa. You spend so much time with her. <laughs> so Merunissa is a real character for her. But, you know, I, I think the, the way to deal with uh, a lot of trauma is to find ways to decompress on your own. I go for long walks. Um, you know, I spend good time over weekends with my friends. And I also feel that I do it because I feel I have a, um, you know, in Punjabi and of course in Hindi we say, Mitti da kars. I feel I come from Firozpur and I have to pay the debt back to that town which raised me. So all of my trilogy, all of my writing, and I'm really hoping that once I'm done with the trilogy, I can write a Game of Thrones fantasy and you know, sort of just go fly <laughs> because uh, I, I, have, I have done this, I think. And I feel that once Kashmir is done, I'm going to go to Firozpur 
विद ऑल माई थ्री बुक्स गो टू दतलुज रिवर गो टू सैनी वाला से मिट्टी का कर्ज अदा हो गया यू नो आई हैव डन माई बेट बट आई थिंक दैट इज वॉट ड्राइव टू डू दैट yeah and uh, another discovery that i made through your book was uh, ustad daman uh, mm-hmm. the, the first page of your hyderabad book because we all often talk about literature in partition what manto wrote what uh, isma chiptai or amrita pritham or other writers have mm-hmm. written but we forgot about ustad daman and yeah. uh, you also made a read on your instagram and i yeah. would like to ask everybody to go and follow manreet on instagram where she is most active and you could follow her writing there also and her very interesting reels i think the one of the very few writers who are who invest a little time in uh, making reels as detailed as manreet so please do and uh, go and follow manreet on instagram uh, but <clears throat> you also mentioned that somebody said that uh, there was blood on everybody's uh, hand uh and uh, ustad daman's line i think reiterated the same feeling but with yes. certain poetic um romanticism maybe yeah in fact since you're saying that shall i just read it out for yeah. the audience to so get a sense so this is on the sort of you know my epigraph uh, for the novel because i think uh you know just before i get into it i think poets do uh what what prose writers take 400 pages poets do in two lines right it's that kind of a the the power of poetry is such in fact when the long walk home as i said i wrote after you know teaching myself to write and write a novel and then it came out and and the long walk home really looks at uh, the sort of turbulent 20th century history of punjab uh, you know at through the lens of one family and that's what i'm doing there and then when gulzar saab read it he said uh, we spoke and he said manreet ji i like it so much i'm going to dedicate a share to it and when he dedicated a share uh, you know his share summed up in four lines what i took 400 pages to write so you know, i feel that is the power of poetry and you know as you say ishan ustad daman says this and he is really a poet of the people because i i will read out this uh, which is one couplet from his poem but you know uh, often you will see if you do a google search and go down that rabbit hole you know when they open the corridor for pakistani punjabis and indian punjabis to cross there was a person who crossed over from the other side he had a child on his shoulders and the child was holding a play card which had ustad daman's poem on it so you know he, he was a true poet because he speaks to the people and and sort of the 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 trauma that they have gone through and he says इस मुल्क दी वंड कोलो यारो खोए तुसी वी हो खोए असी वी हां इस मुल्क दी वंड कोलो यारो खोए तुसी वी हो खोए असी वी हां लाली अखां दी पई दसदी है रोए तुसी वी हो रोए असी वी हां यू नो विद पार्टिशन ऑफ दिस लैंड फ्रेंड्स यू लॉस्ट एज डिड वी द रेडनेस ऑफ आइस क्रॉनिकल्स यू वेप्ट एज डिड वी एंड आई थिंक दैट इन मेनी वेज इज जस्ट द थीम ऑफ partition you know uh. we i think we uh, and do you remember gulzar saab's share that he dedicated yes i do Would i do like <laughs> <that>? <laughs> let me try and remember so as i said it is the story of really punjab's 20th century history so i took on a huge task taking the 100 year history and telling it through the life of a family and a family is again based in the border town of ferozpur because that's for me where a, all the stories of partition came from and gulzar saab's uh, share goes ye fasle teri galiyon ke humse tay na ho ye fasle teri galiyon ke humse tay na hue hazar baar chale hum hazar baar ruke kaun si mitti watan ki mitti hai jigar mein something aankhon mein gubar liye chale so you know it's the same it, it, my story is about a man who wakes up in the middle of the night with severe chest pains and he feels okay you know maybe if i take a walk because he he's a habitual drinker he says i maybe if i take a walk you know whatever it will go away and he's a habitual walker as well so the story begins with that and he does his walk and in this walk he's remembering his life story you know growing up so and then gulzar saab gives me this uh share in which you know hazar baar ruke hum har hazar baar chale 
कौन सी मिट्टी वतन की मिट्टी थी बिकॉज दिस गाइज ऑल्सो हीज कम फ्रॉम दी अदर साइड इज लुकिंग बैक ही से on basant panchmi the kites can go across but i can't you know and it was magical he has this couplet which sums up my book and i told gulzar sahab that and he was like you know he is just he's an absolute gem <laughs> what would you say to a person like that yeah and and these books are also you know literary gems and you were called the literary star genius by uh, none other than Kushan Singh, so we can't, uh, you know, doubt that. <laughs> But oh, those who are watching us, please, uh, we request you, uh, and I highly recommend this historical fiction, these two books, Lahore and Hyderabad. And you have to get Kashmir when it is out. Uh, that is a must. And uh, we'll we'll definitely have another conversation. We have some questions from the audience. I think pouring in. Uh, let me check. So what's uh, Noor Nuri Mira says hi. This is Bakir, student of history. Partition was somehow uh, an inevitable issue, as pointed by many historians. Then why Gandhi said that partition is imperative without India? It would be. I think it's not related to the conversation today, Bakir. So we are going to skip that question, and you must listen to uh, our conversation with uh, some other. uh historians who, which is available on uh, our youtube on partition uh, where they have mentioned about gandhi's role so that would be a good start for you so they all have asked which partition novel or story you like the most oh <laughs> you know i don't know if i can say i like it the most uh, because i i do feel that um, uh, our partition literature is limited you know uh, and i i will give you a reason why i say that i live in new york city which is sort of the home of the jewish diaspora and every year there are these brilliant books which come out fiction non fiction memoir biographies which are dealing with the jewish holocaust and every year some of those books make it to these awards and you know win literary prizes and we know what the function of awards does finally it's it serves to bring the book up and to the notice of people and i do not believe that we have to do comparisons between sort of traumas and catastrophes but to just place it into perspective partition is huge it is a humongous event which does not get the attention uh, that it absolutely deserves uh, you know which is from historians academics uh, etc but even from writers because you know th- there is this it's a festering wound within all of us and and we just need to have more and more stories being told uh so for me i read i devour partition literature i read as much as i can uh you know and and i feel a lot of times that literature is non uh, english it is in what we call the vernacular so, you know in punjabi in hindi i don't read bangla so i i read it in translation uh, i don't read urdu but i understand urdu um you know and but i will have to talk about one novel which to me to my development as a writer is very important which is um the train to pakistan by kushwan singh and i will tell you why uh, despite growing up in a sikh household you know when my father used to hand me uh, you know the newspaper where kushwan singh's editorial used to come out right uh, and my father would say okay read this because you know for any sardar he was the sardar who had this command on english language and and so despite all that i came to train to pakistan very late and when i did uh, uh i was smack i was like oh wow and i'll tell you the reason why because like any good student of english literature i grew up on literature victorian british literature right hardy and dickens and and shakespeare but when i read train to pakistan i could smell the air of punjab i could feel punjab ki mitti i could I, i could see how a native indian writer could use the english language to bring those stories to the fore and it just it just left me uh, you know hungering for more so and also because train to pakistan again at the heart there is this love story uh, you know and then he he spins this entire narrative around it and i think it's also one of the first books which came out fiction which came out of 47 in english um but you know as you mentioned I mean, 
Ismat Chuktai, Amrita Pritam, you know, we, we just, you read everybody you can. There is no best or better. They're all fantastic. They're all fabulous. No doubt. So thank you so much, Manreet, for, uh, for this conversation. And, uh, and congratulations on the nomination that you received this morning from Tata Lit Prize for your Lahore book. Uh, so this Thank book you. has been nominated for the Tata Lit for Life. Uh, I think lit, uh, Tata Mumbai. Tata Lit, lit Live. Uh, yeah, yes. Lit best Live fiction. Festival for the best fiction uh, category. And I hope, I, I, I wish that we had a category like this in Carvan Book Prize too, but we don't have a category for fiction right mm -hmm. now, but we hope to have this because I think historical fiction is a, as a genre is, is right now in its developing phase in India. It's not, uh, yeah. it's not completely there, but I hope more writers come up, as you said, to write about, even if on partition or other, uh, I don't know if there is any other event as, as, as um, well known as partition as well, uh, in our in our memories as well documented in our memories than partition so i think that's for writers who are watching us it is it's the best theme to start with uh, your writing journey keep writing and i hope that we'll get, get to read kashmir very soon uh, as you said it's it's with the publishers now and we hope to get it uh, get to read it next year and hope to have you uh, on Caravan again. Hopefully, I think you are also visiting India very soon. So yes. we hope to host you offline. Let's 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 do an offline conversation as well with you in Delhi. Uh, and uh, for those who are watching us right now, we are finally back on Caravan with our lecture series after two months. So do join us on eighth of November. It's again a long break between two sessions, but. I'll be traveling to some cities in between. So that's why we have decided to do another lecture on 8th, which is a Karwan distinguished lecture on can a festival of goddess be secular, the art and politics of Durga Pujas in contemporary Calcutta by uh, Professor Tapati Ghor Thakurta, who is uh, the person behind the, the, the recent uh, UNESCO World Heritage Tag to Durga Pujas. So it's, it's going to be a fantastic session. So don't forget to join us on 8th November, 6 p.m. on this platform, Caravan. And do subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, like the video, comment, and get these books from your nearest bookstore if there are. Uh, in Kanpur, there's only one bookstore, unfortunately. But if you have good bookstores, get it offline. But if you do not have a bookstore, like I do not have a bookstore in my city, get it on Amazon or Flipkart. And uh, yeah, keep keep supporting Carvan. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and we'll be back again very soon. Thank you, Ishan. Thank you again. And I just want to, I think that the next distinguished lecture sounds fascinating. I will try to tune in. And I just want to leave uh, with one thought, you know, as you said, partition is a well-known but it is not well chronicled. And yeah. it is, I think it is behoves all of us to engage with the theme in whatever way we can, whether it's by reading voraciously, talking about it, uh, discussing it with friends, family, whoever, and uh, or writing. So, you know, I, I, I power to all the writers out there and uh, find the stories that speak to you and write them, tell them.